Greetings, adventure. Welcome to the D20 Academy podcast. My name is Shal Konishiro, and this is episode 24, Monster Monday on Dragons. Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Monster Monday. Um, this is the episode I make on the first Monday of every month, and I use it to highlight and feature a really cool monster from Dungeons & Dragons. Um, I'm going to start with kind of a brief history of the monster in past game revisions, what inspired its conception, I'll go into its appearance and its abilities, the history and the culture and all of that, and how to incorporate this monster into your games, into your campaign. Uh, this one was a lot of fun to make and plan, and I'm really excited uh, to, to get on to talking about dragons. They're one of my favorite uh, monsters in the game. Um, so hopefully you guys learn a lot, hopefully you guys get inspired, and let's just jump right into it. Okay, so dragons are, of course, a big part of Dungeons & Dragons and its theme, as, you know, they take up half of the game's name, right? Dungeons & Dragons. Um, they were first introduced in the original box set of D&D in 1974 when the game was first released, and they've appeared in every edition since. Um, while the types and colors of, of dragons have expanded and varied over time, kind of the basic concept of dragons in D&D has been... Um, mostly the same, right? Uh, now, now D and D, right, uh, is a staple of the, of the fantasy uh, fantasy genre. Um, but like everything else in the fantasy genre, it descends from and is inspired by the work of Tolkien. Um, and this is especially pre- prevalent when it comes to dragons, um, which which are very similar to um, Smaug, the the draconic antagonist of the Hobbit. Um, dragons in D and D, well, dragons are very different and varied throughout history and different, you know, uh, different cultures, mythology, um, and, and stories, as well as just the fantasy genre and dragons are, you know, represented in all these different ways. Um, the dragons from D&D are pretty similar to, um, the dragons in, in Middle-earth, um, which really we, the only, um, yeah, encounter readers have with dragons when it comes to Tolkien's work is Smaug, who is the um you know the big the big bad guy in in the Hobbit. So, um yeah, they're 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 pretty similar to kind of classic dragons, um, based off of off of Tolkien's work. And I I may not be completely correct in this assumption, but I believe the concept of different colored dragons and their various affinities to the different elements, right? Like the substance they unleash with their when they you know with their breath. Um, I think that actually stems from D&D, you know, having red dragons breathe fire and white dragons breathe ice and all that kind of stuff. I think, I, 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 may, I may be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure that concept, um, having different colored dragons who, like, breathe different elements or whatever, I think that actually does come from Dungeons and & Dragons. Um, and the, the different types of dragons, the different colors of dragons, they've been included in the game all the way from, from the game's conception. Um, but different variations of dragons... Um, such as those based around different gems or light or darkness or the sun or the stars or different minerals, whatever. Um, those have all appeared in various editions and manuals throughout the game's history. Um, but now, in 5th edition, dragons are broken into two types, chromatic and metallic. Um, so chromatic are just regular colors. Um, there, there's five chromatic colors. Um, there's black, white, red, blue, and green. And then metallic um, which is gold, silver, copper, brass, and bronze. Um, so dragons ha- are kind of split into those two different types. Chromatic dragons are kind of typical evil, greedy, um, destructive dragons in the fantasy genre, and metallic dragons are more like beautiful and benevolent and good-hearted um, dragons. And I-, I think the whole metallic kind of scale concept and like benevolent dragons... Um, is also kind of new, or at least kind of started with uh, with D and I don't think they really appeared uh, metallic dragons or like benevolent dragons really appeared a lot in um, in other you know kind of pieces of fantasy um, or, or history. Um, there are also a couple of different variants um, that are not specifically like dragons, but things that are kind of related to dragons. Different variants of dragons um, in fifth edition, which I will talk about later on in the episode. Um, so moving on to appearance, um, well, the different colored dragons, they all kind of have their own unique appearances and quirks. The basic anatomy and such is uniform. Um, as you know, dragons are quadrupedal reptiles, right? They have extended necks, snouts, tails, and wings. 
They're covered in scales, their hands and in claws. They have like horns and spikes, a uniform scale color. Um, kind of just a typical Western dragon. I, I assume if you're listening to this, you know what a dragon is. You know what a classic dragon looks like. Um, that's the same for Dungeons and Dragons. You know, each, you know, I'll kind of break down later each different color dragons. They all have, kind of have different, like how their horns look or kind of, you know, how how their, their build is. Um, but for the most part, they all, you know, follow the same anatomy and they, they all look pretty similar. Um, just, you know, a basic quadrupedal Western dragon. Um, now, moving on to, to the stats, the statistics, um, the abilities of, of dragons. Um, at least in 5th edition, all dragons are separated into four different stat blocks, um, which is dependent on their age. So, in Dungeons & Dragons, um, dragons can live a, a thousand or more years, and they increase in strength and power over time. So, to represent these different stages of a dragon's life in, in gaining strength and power, they're... Um, are four different categories of dragon age. Uh, wormling, young, adult, and ancient. And there's a table in the monster manual which kind of depicts the exact age ranges of each of these um, four different categories. But each age category in each dragon type has its own stat block. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so basically um, there's four stat blocks for each dragon. Um, so the, the, the dragon section of the monster manual is, is pretty thick. Um, it's, it's one of the more fattest, uh, portions of, of the book. Um, just because there's 10 different colors dragons, right? The five chromatic and the five metallic, and each of those have four different stat blocks for the four different ages. Um, now I'm not going to go over every single stat block of every age and color, um, because they're actually pretty similar for the most part. Um, all the dragons have physical attacks like bites and claws and tail attacks, they also have a breath weapon, right, uh, which is, you know, the typical dragon thing when they breathe out, typically fire. Um, and this requires, like, a recharge, right? They can't use this ability all the time. Um, and this is effective at dealing, you know, with multiple enemies at once. And, of course, it deals damage type connected to the dragon's color. Um, also, all dragons are immune to that damage type. Um, that's based around their color. And they all have a walking and a flying speed. They all have blind sight and dark vision, and they can all speak common and draconic. Um, the wormlings, actually, like the youngest age category, uh, can only speak draconic. But yeah, um, now breaking it down to age category, uh, the differences in, in, in the stat blocks when it comes to the different age categories, uh, most of the stats are, are still similar, just better as a dragon gets older. So like young dragons, they can make more attacks than a wormling, and those attacks are stronger, they deal more damage, they have a higher chance of hitting. And then of course, they also have a higher armor class and maximum hit points. So this continues through the other age ranges. Every time you move up a, 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 to a different age category, they just are better, you know, just in, in general. Um, but there's also some other changes. Um, adult and ancient dragons, um, they also have the ability to, like, attempt to frighten their opponents. They have this ability called uh, Frightening Presence, I believe, um, which means that at the beginning of their turn, all, like, the enemies within 30 feet of them in their kind of aura have to make a wisdom saving throw or be frightened by them just because they're so awesome. Um... And, of course, they're legendary monsters. Adult and ancient dragons are also legendary monsters, so they have three uses of legendary resistance. They have legendary actions, all of that. Um, now, depending on the color of the dragon, uh, the dragon will deal a, a different damage type with their breath weapon, right? And also be immune to that damage type, like I mentioned before. Um, they also may have a couple small quirks that make them unique. Um, so, so, for example, black, green, gold, and bronze dragons are amphibious and have a swimming speed. Blue and brass dragons have a burrow speed. White dragons have the ice walk ability. Um, also, some colors are stronger than others, so not all dragons are, are equal when, in regards to color. Um, so, talking about the chromatic dragons, from weakest to strongest, it goes white, black, green, blue, red. And then for the metallic dragons, from weakest to strongest, it goes brass, copper, bronze, silver, and gold. Um, the final differences in the, in the stat blocks comes between the chromatic dragons and the metallic dragons. So there is the alignment difference. Um, all the chromatic dragons are evil, whether it be chaotic evil, neutral evil, lawful evil, and all the metallic dragons are good, right? Whether it be lawful, neutral, or chaotic good. Um, but other than the difference in the alignments, they actually don't have too many differences when it comes to, 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 their, to their stat blocks. Um, one difference is that the metallic dragon, uh, their breath weapon, can either deal damage of the specific damage type, like regular, or also have another effect. So, um, brass dragons, they can use their breath to make victims fall asleep. 
Bronze dragons can use their breath to push enemies back. Copper dragons can use their breath to slow enemies. Gold can weaken enemies. And silver can paralyze enemies. Also, um, ancient metallic dragons have the ability to shapeshift into animals and humanoids, um, which is pretty interesting. And I don't think that's seen very often in, in the fantasy genre or other you know works of fantasy. Um, the ability for dragons to be able to transform and shapeshift in, into other creatures. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the stat block breakdown. Um, once again, I don't want to go too deep into every single detail on all their stat blocks, because once again, there's tons of different stat blocks for age range, uh, you know, for, for stat blocks for each age category, and then for each color of dragon. Um, but yeah, they are, um, you know, they're they're pretty classic they they have abilities that you'd assume a dragon to have they have pretty high armor class because they have scales um the, you know they can fly because they have wings they can slash with their claws and bite and they can breathe fire or ice or whatever depending on their color um so their stat blocks reflect what you would expect a you know a typical dragon to have the ability to do um so yeah um moving on to the different variants um of of dragons um now there are like the variants when it comes to like chromatic and metallic i guess but those are all still just like classic dragons they're all just called dragons um but there's other creatures uh throughout dd's history but also in, in the fifth edition monster manual um that are like variants on the dragon um i think four exist in the monster manual there may be more in other uh fifth edition resources but to my knowledge um, there are only four that exist uh, in 5th edition, and those are all in the Monster Manual. The first is a Draco Lich, um, which is basically just a Dragon Lich. Um, if you don't know what a Lich is, go ahead and listen to last week's uh, Monster Monday, which was all about Liches. Um, but basically, Liches are, are undead uh, wizards um, who have attained uh, immortality, so they can complete their like millennia-long plots and schemes and become super powerful. Um, in the same way, some dragons don't want to be limited by death and want to be immortal so they can weave big plots and schemes, so they will also try to attain lichdom, attain Im immortality on death, um, and, you know, then they become a Draco Lich. Um, so they're a dragon lich. They aren't spellcasters like typical liches um, would be. Um, and they, they just have a couple differences. They basically just remember like a, resemble like a skeletal dragon. Um, but to Draco Lichify, uh, a dragon of your choice, um, you just have to make a couple minimal changes, which are detailed in the monster manual. So, you know, if you want to take a adult blue dragon and make it into a Draco Lich, you just take the stats of the adult blue dragon and then just make a couple different changes to the, um, to, to the stat block. Um, and the changes that you have to make are, are detailed in the monster manual. Um, so you can kind of take which dragon you want and then just add the couple changes to turn them into a Draco Lich, um, which is nice that they didn't include, once again, like a stat block for every single age range of every single color for all the Draco Liches, because that would just be way too many dragons in the monster manual. Um, so it, it's cool um, that they, they, they provided this... Um, this this concept of, of like a of like a, a different kind of creature a different variant of a creature but didn't like provide its own stat block just provided changes you make to the original stat block which is really not done uh in much other places in fifth edition um definitely not in the monster manual i barely see any anything else um any other variants to, to creatures and it just uh provides changes to a stat block and not a whole new stat block um and i kind of like it and it's it's nice and, and simplistic and it really uh helps because instead of combing through tons of different draco lich stats for all the different colors and ages you can just take the regular stats and then just make the little changes for it to turn it into a draco lich which is nice um and this same method is used for shadow dragons um so a shadow dragon is one that comes from or has been affected by the shadow fell which is one of the planes uh, of existence the planes of existence in D D, you may be knowledgeable about it or maybe may not be um, but basically, Dungeons and Dragons takes place in a multiverse. So the material plane is like you know the world, um, and then there's like the elemental planes, and then there's like you you know there's different like planes of existence around it that resemble like chaos or order or good or evil or whatever. There's tons of different like planes, uh, uh, you know, 
surrounding the material plane. It's all detailed in the back of the, the player's handbook and detailed even more in the Dungeon Master's Guide. I do want to do a an episode um, or two on, on the multiverse and the planes of existence, um, so expect that sometime in the future. Um, but the Shadowfell is one of these uh, different planes of existence, which is basically just a, a big bummer. Um, it's just always dark there. It's super sad and solemn and quiet. And, you know, I don't think it's... I, I don't I haven't researched it too much, but I don't think it's, like, very inherently evil. It's just kind of a dark, kind of depressing place to be in. Um, and if a dragon is born in the Shadowfell, or it's, you know, been affected by the Shadowfell in some way, maybe it, it lived there for a long time, or there's some rift that it lives next to that has affected it from the Shadowfell, um, it can turn into a Shadow Dragon. And it's similar to the, to the Draco Lich, um, these, these, you know, the 5th edition Monster Manual doesn't provide a stat block for every single age and color dragon with, you know, as a Shadow Dragon. Instead, it just makes gives you a couple minimal changes you make to the stat block of your choice, um, to the dragon of your choice, to, to shadow Shadowify it. Um, which, once again, I think is really nice and helpful and uh, makes things less confusing um, and hard to, hard to find for, for Dungeon Masters. The third variant of a dragon in 5th edition is a wyvern. Um, a wyvern is a type of dragon um, that resembles, you know, kind of a classic dragon, but it is bipedal and has a stinger. And instead of having four legs and two wings, they have two legs and two wings. Um, so similar to the dragons in Game of Thrones or how Smaug is represented in, in the recent Hobbit films, um, that's kind of what a, what a wyvern looks like. Um... So, you know, they, instead of, you know, the classic dragon has the, the four legs plus wings, wyverns just have two legs and their are their front two legs slash their arms kind of double as their wings as well. Um, so you can look up wyvern or the dragons from Game of Thrones or Smaug from the Hobbit films to kind of get an idea of what a wyvern looks like. Um, but in the Wonder Dungeons and Dragons, uh, they also have a stinger. Um, now, wyverns are much more, like, wild and animalistic, um, than, than regular dragons. They, they can't communicate, they can't speak, um, they don't, also don't have, like, colored scales or a breath weapon. They're just kind of leathery, like, brown leathery. Um, they don't have the ability to, like, you know, breathe fire or ice or anything. Um, a basic stat block is provided in the monster manual for wyverns. Um, I think they're, like, Sean's writing seven or something. They're okay... Um, they're not that interesting. They can kind of just like claw, bite, or attack with the stinger, and they can, you know, fly around. You know, once again, it's, you know, it's what I, it, it's a pretty simple stat block. It, it's a pretty simple monster. Um, if you ever want to use, for some reason, a wyvern instead of a regular dragon, I'll talk about all, 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 using dragons in your campaign later on. Um, but if you can't already tell, I don't really like wyverns. Um, but anyway, moving on to the fourth variant of dragons in 5th uh, edition is the Dragon Turtle. Um, the Dragon Turtle is this massive beast that dwells in the ocean. Um, it kind of resembles a spiked and horned turtle with sharp teeth and scales. Um, a mix between a dragon and a turtle. Um, they can only speak Aquan, um, which is the uh, elemental language uh, with an affinity towards like water, to, to the elemental plane of water, uh, and Draconic. And their breath weapon is a steam breath weapon, which is pretty unique and cool. And uh, they also are pretty deadly. Um, they're challenge rating 17, so they're, they're pretty strong. And they could really provide a wild encounter um, in a pirate or swashbuckling themed campaign as kind of this great, uh, you know, creature beneath, uh, you know, the waves uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the open ocean, um, this, this crazy you know, dragon turtle coming up out of the water because, you know, they're huge. They're, like, as big as, like, three ships. Um, dragon turtles are awesome. I love them so much. I think everyone who knows what a dragon turtle is loves them. <laughs> um, it's just such a weird but awesome thing at the same time. Um, I don't think anyone ever complains that a dragon turtle exists in D&D because why would you? It's a dragon and a turtle, some of two of the best things in the world. Um, but, like... Jokes and memes aside, it is actually a pretty cool monster with some pretty cool abilities and, like, is actually kind of a crazy threat. Um, so if you if you can fit them into your campaign, I'd suggest it because they're just cool. And also, you know, 
mixing two animals always goes well in D&D, right? I mean, think about owl bears. Okay, moving on to the kind of history, culture, more details on, on the story-based elements, um, the flavor element of dragons, because um, we've kind of just talked about the, the numbers and, and the snap locks, all that kind of stuff. I want to get back into dragons, talk about, um, you know, just kind of the flavor and the story around them. Um, so in, in the Forgotten Realms, um, which once again is kind of the, the typical uh, D&D campaign world, basically all the 5th the edition material, um, any information they have on like monsters or characters or whatever, um, and they reference like events in history or whatever, it all takes place, or like locations in the world, it all takes place in, in the campaign setting, the Forgotten Realms. Uh, most D&D campaigns are, are played in the Forgotten Realms. Um, in the Forgotten Realms, dragons... Um, serve one of two gods. Um, there is Tiamat uh, and Bahamut. Now, Tiamat is an evil lesser goddess, and she lives in um, the top layer of the Nine Hells, and she resembles this massive dragon, and she has five heads, and each of these different heads is a different chromatic color. So, you know, black, white, red, uh, green, and blue. Um, she once ruled the Nine Hells, I believe, um, but then Avernus, who is now the current Lord of the Nine Hells, kind of usurped her and then put her in charge of the first layer of the Nine Hells. And she doesn't like that, and she wants to get back of him someday. Um, I'm not the expert on lore in the Forgotten Realms and stuff, and definitely not about the, the, the gods and the demon lords and all that kind of... that area um, <laughs> of lore when it comes to the Forgotten Realms, so I may get a couple facts wrong, but I, I believe that that's what happened in the lore. Um, Tiamat is crazy. Um, she's obviously very evil. Uh, she kind of has all the, the the craziest, most evil aspects of dragons. She's greedy and powerful and uh, lustful and prideful. Um, and all the chromatic dragons have kind of spawned from her lineage. And they all, um, you know, kind of seek to emulate her. Um, and, you know, seek to to also become very strong and powerful and are driven by their greed and their lust for treasure and such. Um, so that's, that's Tiamat. Um, I think she's actually featured quite a lot, uh, in fifth edition, like materials and adventures. I know there's a whole two part, uh, campaign, uh, module for fifth edition, uh, focusing around Tiamat on dragons. Uh, I believe it's the first part is called Horde of the Dragon Queen. And the second, I don't, I don't recall what the second part is called. Um, but that one's all focused around Tiamat and the cult of Tiamat, I think. And then I think even in the the new the new module they just released a descent into avernus or yeah descent into avernus i think it's called um i think she's also featured in that because that one goes into the nine hells and, and you know she rules over the first layer of the nine hells so yeah she's actually kind of featured and talked about quite a lot in fifth edition material um so i'm not gonna give all lore and all this kind of stuff about her because yeah, i'm pretty sure you can find that information um in a couple different places when it comes to fifth edition material who is not featured or talked about a lot though is bahamut um, he is also known as the Platinum Dragon, and he's kind of the benevolent, heroic um, god of the metallic dragons. Uh, he is he is a lesser god, uh, just like Tiamat. And he lives in Mount Celestia, I think, which is one of the outer planes, kind of like this, this heavenly celestial realm. Um, he's, you know, just a really, a, a very kind of like righteous, lawful good, protect the innocent, justice and truth uh, kind of god. He has typically, uh, I think in the Fern Realms, like lots and lots of paladins and followers who seek to emulate him. Uh, he's just, you know, a, a very obvious god when it, you know, when it comes to like justice and truth and protection and stamp out the darkness and all that kind of stuff. Um, so he, he's, he's pretty famous uh, in D&D. If you're playing like a paladin or a cleric, most people choose to follow Bahamut. He's just a pretty obvious, typical choice. Um... But I don't think he really appears in any, like, 5th edition material. Like, I don't think he has a stat block anywhere, or he's really featured in anything. Um, but I, in, in the lore, I think it's talked about quite a lot, the conflict between Tiamat and Bahamut. Um, I don't know if they were siblings or something. Once again, my lore about the Faron Realms is not super top-notch. Um, but basically, they just have this ongoing conflict, um, because they both rule over dragons, uh, the two different types of dragons, right? And, you know, Tiamat... Uh, and her chromatic dragons wants to want to be the only dragons in, in the world. They want to they want to destroy all the metallic dragons, to, you know, take over the world. Um, 
and Bahamut and his metonic dragons are trying to protect the world and, you know, kind of wipe out the chromatic dragons who are doing evil things. So this kind of conflict between Tiamat, Bahamut, the chromatic and the metallic dragons um, is, um, you know, pretty, pretty prevalent in, in Forgotten Realms lore. Um, and definitely when it comes to dragons. Um, now, moving away from the Forgotten Realms, um, dragons in D&D are pretty similar um, to most dragons in pop culture, like I said. Um, not only in appearance, but also, you know, they do typical dragon things. They collect treasure hordes, they dwell in layers, they can live for centuries. Um, pretty tropey, typical fantasy genre stuff. Um, uh, yeah, so dragons in D&D are not unique, really, or super different or fresh uh, in any way. They're kind of just your good old classical dragons, um, which, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really have a problem with. Um, I want to focus on chromatic dragons, though, here real quick. I, I want to focus on both chromatic and met metallic dragons. Um, kind of the, the, their differences and such. Um, now, chromatic dragons are evil. Uh, they're, they're driven by greed and pride and pleasure and cruelty. Um, they're selfish. They hate all other beings that threaten their power, um, especially other dragons. And they just they do things for themselves and their needs, um, and they use their great power to abuse and harm others, um, especially humanoids. Um, because they kind of have a superiority complex, and humanoids are trying to build kingdoms and civilize the world and create societies. And dragons, chromatic dragons, kind of feel like, oh no, you're trying to make yourself the top of the world, you're trying to make yourself the, you know, the top of the food chain. And you know, we need to put you in your place by destroying your city and killing everyone. <clears throat> now, black dragons. Um, I could, I'm, I'm going to focus on each different color dragon here. Um, black dragons are kind of the 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 worst the most evil are morally disgusting they revel in cruelty and punishment they're sadistic they're terrifying um they like they they like use like baiting they they play with and taunt their prey and their victims um and they're also big cowards um they will flee from any fight they aren't sure to win they are super paranoid about like other dragons and they're always like trying to send out scouts and things um to spy on other dragons definitely a more powerful one so that they don't have to get into a conflict um, they just enjoy just hurting and causing pain to people they know they can beat, and, um, they're just pretty, pretty bad, pretty bad people. Um, they usually dwell in, like, crypts and swamps, um, and they, they, they breathe acid, and they have, like, these kind of skull-like faces, um, the, their faces are more, more, like, skeletal, and they have these hooked horns. Um, the way they explain it in, in the Monster Manual is that, like, the the acid within them, um, you know, that they produce in their stomach and that they can breathe, um, kind of slowly erodes the inside, uh, of them, and which is why, like, their face is, like, slowly dissolving through acid, so they kind of take on this, this skull-like appearance, uh, in their faces, because the acid is kind of eating away at them, which I thought was pretty cool. Next, we got our blue dragons. Blue dragons are prideful and vain, um, they enjoy lording over others, subjecting lesser beings to work for them, um, they're also kind of patient and methodical, and they can prove a pretty frustrating and difficult opponent. Blue dragons usually dwell in deserts, preying on travelers and caravans, um, and they can breathe lightning, and they have a single horn atop their head, kind of like a unicorn horn, but a little more thicker and, you know, not twisty and beautiful. Um, and so they, they'll kind of, like, their, their tactic is to, like, if they see a caravan coming, they'll burrow into the dirt, just their horn sticks out, so it kind of look like rocks. And when the caravan or travelers get close enough, they burst out of the sand and attack while sand is, like, falling from their bodies and blinding all their opponents. And that sounds awesome and terrifying. And I think blue dragons are really cool. <laughs> uh, next are green dragons, which are cunning and mischievous. Um, they use their wit and their trickery, trickery to make up for their physical weakness. Um, in comparison to other dragons, green dragons are one of the, the, weaker, the weaker kinds. Um, when it comes to, like, you know, their, their physical forms. So they make up for that um, with their their intelligence and their, their cunning and their strategy. Um, they weave schemes over decades. They use manipulation and corruption to topple kingdoms, destroy other dragons. Um, they're, they're very uh, dangerous uh, and, you know, even though they're physically uh, weaker than other dragons because of their, their intelligence and their brilliance and their, their plotting, um, they can actually prove to maybe be one, one of the, you know, the most powerful dragons of, of all the types. They usually dwell in, like, forests and jungles. Um, they breathe poison, 
and they feature leathery frills and spines uh, instead of horns or spikes. All right, red dragons. Red dragons are arrogant and powerful. They're the strongest dragon, and they take great pride in their position and power. They do things only for themselves, and they have an insatiable lust for treasure and gold. They, they Also, they, they like revel in destruction and causing pain to others, and they are true dangers to the world. Um, they breathe fire, they dwell on mountains and volcanoes, and they have these very muscular statures and kind of black stripes. Um, red dragons in D&D are your typical dragon, your typical western Tolkien dragon. Um, they're, they're huge and powerful, and they collect hordes of treasure and gold. They destroy whole kingdoms and civilizations. Um, they unleash these torrents of flame from their throats. Um, your typical fire-breathing, scary, winged dragon uh, is all embodied in the red dragon. Um, so while they're the most stereotypical dragon, they're also one of the most awesome. Finally, for the chromatic dragons, we have white dragons. Um, white dragons are kind of more animalistic and greedy. Um, they're the least intelligent of the dragons. They act more on primal ur urges like hunger or pleasure. Um, and they love like hunting and combat against wild animals. Um, they're, they're much more animalistic, more, more like a, a wild beast than an intelligent kind of dragon. Um, they breathe ice. They dwell in like frigid climates and like icy caverns and in the mountains. And they have extended snouts and a sleek aerodynamic build. Um, the, I think this is the first dragon I was introduced to in D&D. Um, just a real quick tangent. Um, when I first started playing, I, I had the the fifth, the, oh, excuse me, the fourth edition starter set, and there's a little mission in the in the back of the starter set, and I think the main antagonist is like a, a young, like a wormling or a young white dragon that you have to defeat, um, and uh, the art for it was really awesome, and even right now uh, in the in the monster manual, the white dragons look super cool. Um, I really like their appearance and the way they're portrayed uh, in Dungeons and Dragons art and lore. Um, but yeah, they're kind of the weakest of the dragons. Uh, they typically kind of like live alone, and they're much more like wild animals than they are, you know, kind of cunning, greedy uh, dragons. Okay, now we're going to be moving on to metallic dragons. Uh, so the metallic dragons are, uh, instead uh, of being driven by greed and pridefulness and destruction, they're they're driven by good and curiosity. Um, they are not prideful or greedy, um, but they instead seek to understand the world as well as protect it. Um, when metallic dragons reach a certain age, um, in their later years, they also gain the ability to shapeshift, and most use this feature to transform into humanoids to explore humanoid establishments and kingdoms and learn all they can. Starting with brass dragons. Brass dragons are charismatic. They seek a good conversation. Um, they love engaging in talk and discourse with other intelligent creatures, and... Um, they're also very smart, um, and they can tell when someone's trying to manipulate them, and when that happens, they engage in kind of this battle of wits and trickery, um, and they really en enjoy kind of intellectual mind games and, and deep conversations and philosophy and such. Um, they usually dwell in, like, hot, dry climates like the desert. They breathe fire, and they are just, like, these massive, stalwart, glorious creatures. Um, the art in the Montreal depicts them um, as kind of these, these tremendous, strong, valiant um um, creatures. Um, I mean, all, I think all the art in the Monster Manual is amazing. Um, that that shows all these different dragons. Um, but the brass dragon is for sure one of one of the cooler looking ones. Um, next, we have bronze dragons. Bronze dragons have kind of an affinity for nature and animals. They love exploring environments and and nature and the ocean, and they collect treasure from all across the world and from ruins and sunken ships. Um, they also kind of have an interest in like warfare. And they enjoy fighting for righteousness in a battle. They love to take, take, take sides in a battle, and and you know, fight and destroy the other side. Um, and bronze dragons typically live on the coast or on islands. They breathe lightning, and they're kind of yellow and green striped. Next, we have copper dragons. Copper dragons are cunning and crafty. Um, they love making jokes and pulling pranks and telling riddles, and uh, they especially enjoy, enjoy the company of bards or, you know, those that can entertain them and tell them stories. Um, they live in kind of caves or in hills. They breathe acid, and they are very sleek and shimmering uh, creatures. Next is gold dragons. Gold dragons are benevolent and wise. Um, they are the most powerful of the metallic dragons. Um, kind of how the red dragon is the most powerful of the chromatic dragons. 
Gold dragons, they seek knowledge above all else, but they also seek to protect the innocent and destroy evil. Um, they can appear sometimes more studious and strict than other metallic dragons, and they also prefer isolation. Um, whereas other, you know, kinds of different kinds of dragons like conversing with other people and other intelligent races and exploring civilization, gold dragons prefer to be isolated and learn all they can about, you know, the mysteries of, of the world and the universe. So they prefer to dwell in, like, hidden, mystical places. Um, gold dragons breathe fire, and they kind of resemble Chinese Chinese dragons in a way. They have, like, the mustache-like spines and the kind of this long serpentine body. Uh, finally, we have silver dragons. F silver dragons are kind of friendly, kind, compassionate dragons. They love assisting those in need. They love engaging in social situations. They're virtuous and benevolent, and they always stamp out darkness wherever it appears. They make their layers in the clouds or in mountain peaks. They breathe ice, and they're kind of frilled smooth. Uh, they kind of have a frilled smooth appearance. Um, if you've kind of noticed, each of the metallic dragons so kind of... Uh, mirrors some of the chromatic dragons in some way, right? Like the gold and the and the red dragon kind of mirror each other as the most powerful of that of that type. Um, copper dragons are kind of cunning and they love riddles and and stuff, and that kind of mirrors with the green dragon, who's also kind of cunning and and, and mischievous and uses tricks. Um, so there is this obvious connection, um, this kind of obvious mirror between chromatic and metallic dragons. Um, and I think that's pretty obviously portrayed and, um, you know, something that's pretty, uh, pretty prevalent and, and obvious in, in Dungeons and Dragons, especially fish, uh, fifth edition. Um, not that it's a bad thing, um, but I think that they, they, they have that down pretty, uh, pretty well. They, they've kind of established this, this relationship between chromatic and metallic dragons and the, kind of the mirror between them, the good, you know, the good and the evil and those that work do things for themselves and those that do things for others. Okay, so that's talking about metallic dragons and chromatic dragons, all that kind of stuff. Now I want to get into campaign integration, how to use dragons in your campaign, in your D&D game. So dragons are awesome, as you already know, um, and they have a multitude of uses in a campaign. Um, well, I think, I think they work best as antagonists or BBEGs. Um, I... The good, men, the good metallic dragons can also serve as interesting NPCs that may aid the party. Um, dragons are intelligent and cunning, making them good BBEGs or minor antagonists for a campaign. Um, having a powerful, greedy, destructive, and strategic opponent can provide a really great challenge for, for a party. Um, in addition, everyone at the table knows what a dragon is and the basics of what it does, which can help keep the attention focused on the story rather than in a realm of confusion for the players, right? There's a lot of monsters in D&D that are unique to D&D that don't really appear anywhere else in, in the fantasy genre, like Mind Flayers um, from my first Monster Monday, Yuan T from my second Monster Monday, Beholders, Owl Bears. So there's some weird creatures in D&D. In, in &D. And for new players who are not really familiar with the game or the monsters from the game, and, and you know they're in a campaign, they're playing as a PC, when there is a villain or a monster that, that they're facing um, that is unknown to the player, they've never heard of them before in, in, the, in the fantasy genre or in stories, it can pull some stuff away from the experience because they don't really know what this being looks like or how they work, and they're a little confused about the whole scenario. But when it comes to dragons, everyone knows what dragons are, everyone knows what dragons look like, everyone knows about the basics of what dragons do, um, so it can help rid confusion from from you know anyone playing the game because everyone around the table understands what dragons are um now i think dragons work best in very small doses and i don't think they should be a common occurrence um in your campaign though it depends on the setting some settings have just like tons of dragons like the dragon lance setting um but me personally i don't think that dragons should be popping up a lot in your campaign i think every encounter with one should be epic and memorable because dragons are awesome, iconic creatures who deserve it. Um, now, while dragons are awesome, um, their combat capabilities are not really anything fresh or unique. So an encounter with one may get boring or repetitive um, for some people. In Critical Role, right, which is the massively successful uh, Dungeons & Dragons stream, um, you've probably heard of it before. Um, if you haven't, go check it out, go listen to it, it's amazing, you can learn a lot from it. Um, but in this show, in Critical Role, Matthew Mercer, who is the dungeon master, um, 
there was this this long segment um, of the first campaign, which was focused on this team of, of dragons, one from each color of the chromatic spectrum. Um, and the main dragon antagonist um, was a, a green dragon, and she actually had the ability to spell cast, right? Because she's a trickster and manipulator, so she could shape shift or make illusions or, you know, do all kinds of crazy stuff with the spells. And this made her more of a dangerous and unpredictable opponent um, and kept combat fresh and exciting. Right, because she had so many tricks up her sleeve, and the access to to spell casting, the ability to to manipulate magic, um, it made her uh, much more of a dangerous, much more of a threatening and and unpredictable opponent in in the game, um, and made her facing her way cooler and more interesting than when they fought all the other dragons, which you know just kind of had the basic. If I haven't recharged my breath, I'll like claw some people and and maybe bite this person. And then later on, I'll recharge my breath and kind of do this big attack with, like, fire or acid or something. And it can get a little monotonous and repetitive. So if you can kind of give, uh, have a reason to, um, you know, give some of your your, your dragons more interesting abilities uh, or something that, you know, makes sense with the campaign, makes sense with the character. Um, but give them some more just interesting uh, abilities and features just to kind of spice up combat. I think that could go a really long way. Okay. Personally, um, I am not a big fan of metallic dragons, the whole concept of metallic dragons, um, and I don't really see much use for them in a campaign. Um, also, one thing, it's very difficult to differentiate between brass, bronze, and copper dragons. I, I just, I, I don't know, I, it's very hard for me to tell the difference between them. I really didn't even know the difference between them until I did the research and planning for this episode, um, because... What's the difference between brass, bronze, and copper? Wouldn't they all look exactly the same? In the Monster Manual, they don't. They look pretty much exactly the same. Like, the bronze kind of has also green stripes, but they're all, like, kind of this ruddy golden color, and they're... What's the difference? I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> um, and also, I'm not sure what use a benevolent, powerful being like a metallic dragon would be. What, you know, what would they do in a campaign? I think... Changing metallic dragons into more neutral, unpredictable beings like sphinxes could really mean could mean you know they could really serve a really cool purpose as NPCs who like offer riddles or mind games to the party as the party is on their way to complete a quest, right? But since they're 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 detailed as like good and you know good and benevolent, but also very strong when it comes to their power level, having one as like an ally to the party could be unbalanced and weird, and maybe it's just my opinion. I, I assume some people love metallic dragons and use metallic dragons in campaigns. I bet you can use them for really cool uh, things. Maybe you love metallic dragons. You after hearing the you know the other parts of this this episode, you're like, oh, that's really cool. I want to use them in a campaign. That's fine. All power to those people. But just me personally, I just don't really like the the concept of them in a campaign. They just kind of seem like a weird do sex mock kind of thing. Um, and I think if you're going to use metallic dragons, because I think they do have a lot of potential there. Changing them into a more just neutral, mysterious kind of being, similar to a sphinx, would just make them much, much cooler, I think, um, than having to just be, like, good, regular, you know, just, like, good, righteous people who will fight for what's right. Um, because then you, it makes sense for them to be allying with the party, which means now the party has a dragon on their side, and that's strong and unbalanced and weird. But once again, this is kind of my opinion. I bet you can might be able to figure out ways around this and such. Okay, that being said, I think in all, dragons are awesome, and I think at least one deserves a place in your campaign, whether it be for a single encounter, or a, a BBEG, or a minor antagonist, whatever it is, or an ally to the party. Um, I do really like that the concept of dragons hasn't changed really at all through the editions. They still stay true to what makes them dragons. Um, I'm, I'm really glad they did that because, you know, dragons are very iconic and especially iconic in Dungeons and Dragons, right? You know, they're half of the name of the game. Um, so they're pretty important to, to the universe. Um, and I'm glad that they, they've kept them, uh, still to, to fifth edition. They've, they've kept them awesome and cool looking and strong. Um, and I, I just, I really like what dragons uh, are in D&D and, you know, the capabilities they have in campaigns. Um, just, I think one note would be to Dungeon Masters, maybe not overuse them or toss them into throwaway or random encounters. I just think dragons deserve so much more. 
um, because of just how iconic and awesome, how iconic and awesome they are. I think they kind of deserve, um, you know, a couple sessions of focus or to be a minor antagonist or to be a big ally to the party or something like that. Um, that's just kind of my opinion. Um, but I think, yeah, for DMs, I don't think dragons are those that you kind of just use and throw away encounters or random encounters like goblins or orcs or whatever. Um, I think dragons, you should kind of take some time building up and, you know, kind of really making them awesome, crazy um, characters in the campaign um, that, you know, might provide a really cool challenge to the party, uh, really awesome encounter, um, just because they're very awesome uh, monsters and they have a lot of potential. Okay, that brings us to the end of today's episode. Um, this one was a little shorter than most of my other Monster Mondays, um, but uh, I had a lot of fun uh, doing this one and planning for this one. I, I love dragons a lot, if you couldn't tell um, from the episode. Um, hopefully you guys learned something. Hopefully you guys got inspired um, to, you know, maybe use dragons in your next campaign or use dragons more in the campaign you're running or whatever it is, or even if you're not even DMing a campaign. Whatever it is, um, hopefully you, you enjoyed the episode and, and learned something from it. Um, once again, for updates and all that kind of stuff, you can go follow uh, follow the, the podcast at D20 underscore Academy um, on Instagram. Uh, I, I post uh, stuff on there all the time just about like updates and news and all kind of stuff um, that are related to the podcast and also just D20 Academy as a whole. Um, I'm working on tons of different products and and uh, material that will just that will stretch beyond just the podcast i'm really excited to be showing all you guys that and to be un- unveiling all of that um to you guys so if you haven't already go follow d20 underscore academy on instagram um for all those those news and updates and all that stuff and uh also i think i'm gonna be start uh asking um you guys um my followers on instagram questions they might have uh, that I can answer in a podcast episode or monsters they want to see highlighted uh, in the next Monster Monday, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to be able to have a say in that, uh, want to kind of get your, your opinions and your questions answered on uh, on the podcast, you can go ahead and, and, and follow the Instagram. Okay, guys? Um, thank you so much once again for listening. Hope you guys learned something um, and have a great day.